Okay, we got PowerPoint to record, not for the crutch. Okay, <clears throat> so what's a plasmid? Spectrum is extra DNA. Yeah, it's extra DNA, not necessarily just bacteria. There's eukaryotic plasmids too, but it's a little, a little chromosome. And by little, I mean they're usually 3,000, you can go up to 20,000 base pairs. That's kind of standard plasmid sizes. When you start getting around 8,000, that's what you'd call a big plasmid. Less than that is what you'd call medium. And then three to four is a, is a small plasmid in terms of base pairs. Um, okay, so let's just nomenclature here. So you'll hear two different terms for plasmid interchangeably. You'll hear people, and when you hear molecular biologists talk, they'll say vector or they'll say plasmid. Most of the time, they're kind of uh, synonymous. They kind of mean the same thing. Um, but there is a subtle difference. What's a vector? So a vector is specifically a means of delivery. So it's going to be like a means of delivery, good morning, of X DNA. So when we say vector, a vector can be many things. A plasmid can be a vector, but a vector could also be a virus. It could also be a transposon. So a vector is in general a higher hierarchy under which plasmid can be a vector. But a plasmid is not always a vector, right? Sometimes plasmids, um, they're just wild type plasmids in bacteria, and they might not be programmed to deliver certain packages or things like that. So basically the nutshell is that a vector is a higher hierarchy, and underneath vector you could think of viruses, transposons, or plasmids, and a plasmid can be a vector. But oftentimes when people are talking, they'll say, oh, I built this vector, and they'll mean I built this plasmid. So that's, that's that. Um, what's the purpose of plasmids? Plasmid purpose. So when you look at bacterial biology, right, we talked about how they have the streamlined genomes. But a big part of bacterial biology is also trying to maintain versatility, right? And if you have a bigger genome, you're more versatile. But there's a kind of like a catch between. Um, if you want to streamline your genome, but yet you also want to be versatile, you could have a population of bacteria. So imagine you have a population. And now imagine some bacteria have this yellow plasmid, which gives them X function. And some bacteria have red plasmid, which gives them Y function. And some bacteria have green plasmid, which gives them Z function, okay? Now imagine some shit hits the fan in the, in the environment that they're in, and the only ones that survive are ones with X function, because they have plasmid X, okay? So all these other ones would die, but the ones with these plasmids would survive, and then these plasmids can actually be spit out and picked up by their brothers and sisters. Okay, so it's a way to maintain versatility without having to have every bacteria in that entire population carry that plasmid. Does that make sense? You could just have a tiny subset of the bacteria that carry a special plasmid. Okay, so it's a way, it's a way to maintain versatility in a population of bacteria. Uh, and the way that the versatility is maintained is the plasmid is a little chromosome. So in wild type plasmids of bacteria, what you'll find on these plasmids are usually very interesting genes. Interesting genes, okay? And all these, and these interesting genes usually have specific functions that help them under specific conditions. So oftentimes, good morning, you'll see antibiotic cassettes. So that means things that allow them resistance to antibiotics. Oftentimes you'll see toxins if they want to kill a particular 
uh, neighboring bacteria. You'll find these toxins on plasmids. Um, so they're, they're interesting genes. They're usually not constitutive genes. So we talked about constitutive promoters or housekeeping genes. You're never going to really find housekeeping genes on a plasmid. Why? Well, the, the reason is if, if it's a housekeeping gene, you need it to survive. So it's going to be on your standard chromosome because you can lose plasmids, right? So you don't ever want to put a gene that you need to survive on your plasmid, but you will find genes that you need to f survive under very specific stimulus, if that makes sense. And that's again, the versatility. So you'll find really interesting genes on plasmids that convey versatility. So that's one of the purposes of plasmids is it's a source of exchangeable information. Okay, and we talked about sex last time in eukaryotes. The purpose of sex was, Avery specifically said, exchanging information. So having plasmids in bacteria, having these plasmids is a way that they can kind of replicate or mimic uh, sexual diversification of their gene, of their gene sets. It allows for mobility, exchange of information, okay? And it's just like, if you think of in a community, exchanging information can be valuable under certain circumstances. Same thing with bacteria. They're exchanging, use plasmas to exchange information. Okay, underneath that, you need to know a specific word called conjugation, okay? So what's conjugation? Conjugation is a specific word for this exchange in bacteria. It's bacterial sex, bacterial sex. And conjugation is usually where they will pass a plasmid, okay? And there's machines that do this conjugation and they will make like a little tube across bacteria. And then if this one has a plasmid, it'll spit it through the tube and now they both have plasmid. So you can get bacterial sex with conjugation. So the things that are on the plasmid can be passed, a way to exchange information amongst your daughters, siblings, relatives, brothers and sisters in the bacterial world. Um, is the plasma itself exchanged or is it replicated in the it in both? Good question. So often, so these plasmids, uh, we're going to talk about the, this. There's there's different copy numbers depending on the plasmid. So if you're a high copy number plasmid, really it's not a bacteria with one plasmid. It's a bacteria with like 60 plasmids. So all they need to do is pass one of those plasmids across the conjugation tube, and then it will start replicating in the other in the other bacteria. Does that make sense? So here's this. This is a perfect segue into again back to the selfish gene theory. Is oftentimes so I talked about two purposes of plasmids were. Uh, conjugation or exchange of information and no, that was just one. That was basically one. And then the other thing is that sometimes, sometimes plasmids will have no function. Sometimes plasmids will be parasitic, basically parasitic DNA. So imagine if you're just a plasmid and you figured out a way Sorry. to replicate yourself inside a bacterial cell. Okay. If you hijack the cell, sometimes there isn't, you, there isn't always a function for that. The plasmid might be filled with like transposons, things that only care about themselves. The transposons only care about replicating their own gene. They don't have no serviceable function necessarily in the bacteria. So sometimes you'll find plasmids with no function. It's just that they're parasitic DNA and they figured out a way to utilize the host almost like a virus to replicate its the plasmid genome. Does that make sense? So there isn't always a reason uh, for plasmids. Isn't that what people say is like either came from viruses or just like where viruses came from? Yeah, I actually was thinking about that in this lecture was do I go into that there in theory? Yeah, there could be there could be some kind of ancestral origin where a plasma genome might somehow evolve into a viral genome. And all you need to do is the plasma first step one gets the ability to replicate the plasmid. And as soon as it gets, gets that, all it's got to do is pick up what are called capsid proteins, which can basically package the genome. And then as soon as that happens, it's a virus. So a plasmid, yes, could be literally like the ancestral origin of a virus. But I'm not an expert on that. But I thought about that. Do I talk about that in, uh, in this class? I kind of left it out. That's a great question. Good? Okay. Um, the other thing that you'll find in 
plasmids, which is very interesting, are toxin antidote systems, which we call TA systems. Okay, and this is a perfect example of the selfish genes. So let me let me explain this. So let's say we have plasmid A, okay, and plasmid A encodes two genes. So on this plasmid are a killer, actually let's say uh, antidote, antidote, and a killer. So these are two different genes. If you just have the killer, it'll kill the bacterial cell. If you have both, the antidote will save you. So what these plasmids do is they basically make the cell addicted. And it gets addicted to the antidote. So let me tell you why. Let's say you are a new bacteria. And through conjugation, you get this new plasmid. You didn't have any choice. It just got spit into you. Okay. All of a sudden, you start making both protein products. You start making both antidote and killer proteins, okay? And as long as you're making both, you don't die, okay? Now imagine you replicate, you replicate. So this cell replicates into two cells by binary fission. You have two daughters, okay? And one inherits plasmid A, but second bacteria does not have plasmid A. Okay, but they both, since they replicated through binary fission, share cytoplasm. So you're going to have antidote and killer inherited in the cytoplasm of this bacteria. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, in these systems, is programmed a system where the antidote degrades faster. It falls apart. Okay. Now, all of a sudden, all you are left with is a cell that has killer protein in the cytoplasm and no means of producing more antidote. So what's going to happen to this cell? It's going to die. Now what you've done is you've selected for only cells, the only cells that can survive are ones that perpetually maintain plasmid A. Does that make sense? That's a TA system. So that's a perfect example of what we're talking about when we talk about the selfish gene theory. There's no benefit right at this point to this toxin antidote system to the bacteria. The only benefit is that once you get it, you're addicted and you have to maintain it or you will die. Okay, so this is a perfect example of how a plasmid can serve no function, but can replicate in a population because of the selfish gene theory. Is that clear? Okay. So all that, I should, just, I should just elaborate a little bit more on that. All that is programmed into the bacterial gene. So we talked about operons last, last time, and the proteins or the genes can be programmed to make, so what you would want in a TA system, would you want more antidote or less antidote? More. You would want more antidote, always. You always want more antidote for this to work. And now let me ask another question. As in terms of the toxin, do you want the toxin to be very stable or less stable? You want it to be very, if, from the perspective of the bacteria, they want it to be less stable, but the genes themselves on the plasmid want the toxin to be very stable. So you always have to make and keep the plasmid around. So the way that they can program this is they can put, they can put one promoter here, and let's say we talked about the shine doug arno sequence. So let's say we have one promoter here, P, it makes one messenger RNA transcript, five prime, three prime, and let's say we mutate the shine doug arno So let's say there's no, normally there would be, in a normal operon, there would be a nice shine doug arno here. What's the purpose of the shine doug arno Make sure it stays attached. The purpose of the shine doug arno is that it recruits the ribosome. Ribosome. So if you have a shine doug arno internally, you'll get a ribosome popping on here, and you'll also get a ribosome popping on here, if you have an internal shine doug arno. But if you mutate it, the ribosome will not go there as often into the middle to make, so if this is protein uh, antidote and if this is protein killer, that's a protein. Um, if you mutate that shine delgarno, you're gonna get more antidote because the ribosome is always gonna start here and sometimes it's just gonna fall off. It's not gonna always read through. So you're always gonna get more antidote and less killer 
if you program it that way. So what I'm trying to, I'm trying to harken back to the last lecture of the programming of the circuits and that you can find this type of programming in TA systems and it all relates to how the genes want the system to work. Okay, and then you can program, how would you program um, proteins to be more or less stable? How would you make a protein stable? Lots of uh, like tertiary structures. Yeah. Okay. Let me get more basic question. How? What would be the source of the stability? What could it? What would it really trace back to? Having lots of positive and negatives. It would trace back to the amino acids. Amino acid sequence. So you could program amino acid sequence that is very stable because it folds into a nice conformation and then and the protein is naturally very stable. You could also program a protein by the amino acid structure into something that is less stable because the folding less stable because the folding pattern uh, might not produce enough hydrogen bonds together. It might not, it, so it might not hold its structure as well. And then if it, it would literally just fall apart. Okay. So that's how you could program proteins to be either, uh, more stable, more stable, like the killer protein or less stable, like the antidote. It's all going to be programmed into the amino acids and it's all going to depend on the, like you said, the secondary and tertiary structure and the folding pattern of those proteins. Okay. Okay. So what is the purpose of plasmids in biotechnology? So we talked about purpose of plasmids in, in the field. Why do we use plasmids in, in the lab in biotechnology? Okay. The first thing is storage. So anytime you want to study a protein or a gene, you need to have that gene or protein in your hand. You need to be able to make copies of it. Okay, so you can make copies of it by cl what's called cloning it into a plasmid, gene X, okay? And then forevermore, your bacteria will replicate plasmid A, and every time they replicate plasmid A, they replicate gene X. And you can literally store, so function one is store. You can store genetic information, information in plasmids, okay? So when anybody's studying a gene, if they're not studying the endogenous gene or if they're doing recombinant protein expression or making proteins, it's always going to be stored on a plasmid. Okay? Second thing, libraries. Libraries. So let's say you want to sequence a genome. You want to sequence genome. Okay? But let's say for some reason it's very, very hard, very hard to get sample. It's a very, very rare bacteria that you can only collect two miles underneath the earth, uh, and it's very, very difficult for you to get samples. It costs millions of dollars to send graduate students down there, and maybe one of them has died. Uh, okay, so a very, very difficult sample. What you can do is you can take that DNA. So if this is the genomic DNA of organism X, you can cut it up into little pieces with restriction enzymes, so let's say you cut it up into segments one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You can clone those segments, segment one, segment two, segment three, four, five, into plasmids, okay? And then you can just replicate those plasmids in E. coli. So again, you're storing information. It's a way to create, this is called a library, okay? So that's a term that's on there. A library is basically a bunch of plasmids that hold information, okay? So you have built literally like a library of plasmids and you can store these plasmids in different what are called strains or clones. And then if you wanna sequence a genome, all you gotta do is sequence each of those clones as plasmids and then you can assemble the whole genome. Does that make sense? So that's one uh, second purpose of of plasmids and biotechnology. So first one, the basic is storage. Second one is you can make libraries, literally libraries that can be pulled out just like an, in, just like an actual book. And you can look at sequences of genomes. Um, organization of circuits is three. Organization, organization of circuits. Okay, and this is what I just love to talk about and to think about is 
we want to, oftentimes we want to build controlled environments. And we talked about, to harken back again, to the bacterial expression lecture, it's very important to be able to control expression of genes because that controls the replication, it controls the diversification of cells in a multicellular organism. So we can build circuits that control expression on plasmids. So they're used as means of assembly. Assembly. So if we have plasmid with gene X right there, we can easily insert promoter Y right there. And we can easily insert terminator X right there. So it's a way for us to organize. It's a building infrastructure, a framework from which we can build off of if we want to organize the circuitry of a gene that we want to study. So organization of genetic circuits is the third one. Four, uh, we use them for transformation. Transformation. Okay, so May was talking about, uh, she wrote a proposal and one of the earlier ideas for uh, one of her experiments was manipulating the genomes of Drosophila S2 cells. So let's say you have an S2 cell, okay? And you wanna uh, edit its genome. Well, you have to give that cell a means of expressing the Cas9. We'll talk more about this later, but you have to give that cell a means of expressing the Cas9 enzyme and a means of expressing the guide RNA, which then can complex to edit the genome. So these two pieces are required. And the way that you give these two pieces to the cell is you can put those on two plasmids. You can put a plasmid with the guide RNA and you can put a plasmid with the Cas9 gene and they have their port promoters and they have their terminators. And if you have plasmid A and plasmid B, you can then get cell. If it's a eukaryotic cell, this is called transfection to uptake plasmid A and B. And now in theory, you can edit the chromosomes of the cell by making Cas9 and guide RNA. Okay, so what you need to know now is that plasmids are a means of giving information, giving information. So adding X. Oftentimes in experiments, we're either taking something away, breaking something, or adding something, adding X. And you can add X with plasmids. In bacteria, this is called transformation. In eukaryotic cell culture, it's called transfection. Okay, um, integration. Okay, so in this case, the plasmids won't perpetually replicate in the Drosophila cell culture. So here, these plasmids will eventually die off. They'll just, they'll disappear. And we want that because we don't want the Drosophila cell culture perpetually expressing these genes, Cas9. We want them to go away. But in some cases, you want to literally make a permanent insertion into the chromosome. So let's say you want to insert gene Y into the chromosome and it's in a cell. To do that, sometimes you'll give it a plasmid with gene Y and you'll code it so that there's recognizing homologous regions flanking gene Y, which also flank the regions on your chromosome. And then you can induce homologous recombination to what's called integrate your gene Y into the chromosome. Does that make sense? So the final thing that we use them for is integrating DNA. So you're still, this is a subset of adding, adding something, adding X, but you're adding it permanently. It can get integrated into the chromosome. <clears throat> About halfway done and I have quite a bit, okay. So let's just go through some of the lingo that you need to know for plasmids that you'll hear people say, okay, backbone, if you hear backbone, that means somebody took plasmid A and they're using plasmid A to build different things. So it's like the structural skeleton. So if backbone A is this, you'll, say, you'll see people say, oh, I used plasmid X P blue script as my backbone. That means that you took that plasmid and then you built something from it. That's what backbone means. Uh, gateway plasmid, gateway means Let's erase this. So if you're talking about gateway plasmid, that means you cloned gene Y, gene Y into plasmid A, but you're actually gonna do a lot more stuff with it. You're gonna put it into different plasmids 
that do different things. Maybe in this plasmid, you're going to put a GFP tag on it. In this plasmid, you're going to put a HIST tag on it. In this plasmid, you're going to put a, a yeast to hybrid thingy dingy. What you would do is you'd clone it into the first vector, which would be your gateway, gateway. And then from here, you can do what's called subcloning, subcloning into here, into here, into here. So this is your gateway plasmid in that sense. It's the first thing you cloned it into, but it's not your final destination, okay? So sometimes you'll have what's called a gateway vector, destination plasmid. So uh, the destination plasmid then is gonna be the final destination for your final purpose for your experiment, okay? So if you wanted a GFP tag, and that was your final goal, that's your destination plasmid. But it might not be you don't, you don't necessarily clone it into that one right away, okay? There's intermediate steps sometimes. Shuttle vector. Shuttle vector is, let's say, so plasmids can be very specific. E. coli likes certain plasmids, but maybe Rhodococcus does not like those plasmids, okay? And sometimes you want to make bacteria X, you want to take and put gene inf genetic information into bacteria X, but you don't necessarily have a plasmid for that. So sometimes what you'll do is you'll take a wild plasmid, wild plasmid that somebody found in that. So let's say somebody found plasmid A in bacteria X, okay? And then they isolated plasmid A, and then they cloned information into plasmid A, and then they put plasmid A back into that bacteria. That's called a shuttle vector, shuttle vector, okay? So in weird bacteria that don't like certain plasmids, you'll see all kinds of shuttle vectors where they pulled wild plasmids and then they manipulated those wild plasmids. It's a shuttle vector. Uh, subcloning, we talked about that. Okay, and the way, we'll talk about how you clone uh, extensively in the subsequent lectures, but you do this by either PCR or restriction enzyme digest. So we're gonna talk about that extensively later, so I'm gonna skip that for now. Okay, so what's the structure of a bacterial plasmid? Let's look at that and let's talk about the important information. And here I'll link to a website that you should start becoming very familiar with called AdGene. AdGene is a repository, a library of plasmid information. And you can buy plasmids from there, you can upload plasmids to AdGene. So what I did is I searched PBAD. So PBAD is a plasmid you guys read the paper for and we looked at the operon circuit in PBAD. Um, and so let's look at what that looks like. So if we search add gene PBAD, we can actually pull up a map of the plasmid, okay? So this is what a plasmid looks like. Let me zoom in here. Can I write on this? No, I can't. Um, so I'm gonna come up here and show you the things that are important. So here you see it tells you, here's an ORF, okay? It's showing you this is the direction because the arrow's going this way. And it's coding for ampicillin. So this is a antibiotic cassette. This is what's called an origin. I'm gonna talk about each of these individually in a second. Here you see at the top, those are all restriction enzyme sites. So if you're gonna clone gene X into the plasmid, you'll clone it into those restriction enzyme sites. Um, what else do we have? ARC, what's that? Arabinose. It's the arabinose regulator. So here they have put the arabinose promoter and the repressor protein is ARC. So if you put a protein gene X into this plasmid, it's gonna be constitutively off unless you add arabinose. So what you guys wanna get in the habit of is you wanna start getting comfortable with looking at these maps and understanding what each of these individual pieces are, okay? And that's gonna give you um, incredible information into how you can program the circuits just by studying maps of plasmids. So let's talk about the things that you will find. Okay, so origins. Origins. So an origin is the origin of replication. Okay, and there's important information that is encoded in the origin, including copy number. Copy number. So some plasmids uh, want to maintain themselves at about 60 copies per cell, or 600 copies per cell, or only one copy per cell. 
Okay, so you can have low copy number plasmids and you can have high copy number plasmids and you can have intermediate number plasmids. And all that information is encoded into the origin, which recruits the DNA polymerase, right? Do we remember that from the last lecture? So the origin, if you want to replicate a sequence of DNA, the origin actually acts to recruit the DNA polymerase. So if you have a hyperactive origin that's always recruiting DNA polymerase, you're going to have a high 600 copy plasma. OK, so each of these origins is different. OK, and you'll see different names like you'll see PBR322. That's the name of an origin. So let's see what the origin says on the ad gene. PBR322. So that's that's a high copy origin plasmid. And I think I've linked uh, on the, the ad gene reading section. It's just some notes on the origins. And the other thing you want to know about the origins is that Origins, again, this comes back to selfish gene theory. This is why this, this theory is so important. So these plasmids, so imagine you are a bacterial cell. And let's say you have plasmid A and you have plasmid B. And both these plasmids have the same origin. They have P, B, R, 3, 2, 2. Okay? These plasmids are in a war with each other. Okay? Does B want A to get replicated? No. 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 Does A want B to get replicated? No. They're in a war. One wants to win out. So the important thing here is that you can have competing, competing plasmids. So why is this important? Let's say you want to transform bacteria X, and bacteria X already has a plasmid, a wild-type plasmid sitting in it that has the same origin as the one you're trying to give it. Is that experiment going to work? No, it's destined to fail because those plasmids will compete. So if you ever have a situation where you are building a circuit and you have two plasmids in the same cell, you need to make sure that the origins are compatible. Okay, And there's a list of this information where what you would do is you would say, okay, and sometimes you actually want to put two plasmids in a cell. Maybe you want this one to express A at the same time as you're expressing B. Sometimes you want to engineer this. To make this work, you have to make sure that the origins are not competing. So you would go to a list of the origins and you would check to make sure that they don't compete with each other. Okay, I know you have to go to a class sometime, so you can, you can leave whenever you need to leave. Um, Let's see, bacterial. So I talked about bacterial compatibility. The other thing you'll find are selection cassettes. Okay? So this is like the AMP cassette. So if you have a, bac a bacterial plasmid, you'll see ampicillin. Ampicillin. Or you'll see canamycin. Can R. Ampicillin R. Or you'll see CAM, which is chloramphenicol resistance. What are these? Antibiotic resistance. Yes, they are genes that code for proteins that allow you to resist antibiotics. So the reason that every plasmid will have one of these is because when we use plasmids, we want to force the bacteria to hold on to the plasmid. The only way we can do that, does a bacteria, does a bacteria want to perpetually replicate extra DNA that it doesn't need? No. So we have to force the bacteria to hold on to the plasmid. The way that we do it is we addict the bacteria to the plasmid. We grow them on media that kills them unless they keep the plasmid. So we add antibiotics to our media and we tell the bacteria, you keep this effing plasmid or you will die. That's what we do. So it's the same premise as the toxin antidote. It's the same premise. We use that when we select for uh, plasmids. Okay, you'll find promoters on plasmids, promoters. Each of these promoters is going to have a funky name. You'll see T7, you'll see all kinds of stuff. And you can look up what those promoters are. Since you understand the circuitry of the trip operon, the era operon, the lac operon, you can look up what these do, and it's very easy. Now you understand that. Uh, you'll find terminators. We know what that is. It stops transcription. You will find multi-cloning sites, MCS. That is, if you look at that ad gene plasmid, that's this site where you have all these claw, show, SAC1, bagel2, bagel3, PST4, KPN1. Those are all restriction enzyme sites, and that is what's called a multi-cloning site. You'll see regulators like ERAC, ERAC. So when you look at that plasmid, what you're actually seeing, if I can pull it up, what you're seeing here, this is the actual ORF. Do you see the, yeah, you do. This is the actual ORF 
of ARC, okay? So this codes for the protein ARC, which is a regulator, which is gonna shut off the ARO2 operator, okay? So all this information is coded into these plasmids and people built these plasmids. Okay, let's look at, how much time do I have? Let's look at, Okay, so here's a general plasmid map. You'll see a selectable marker. I'm teaching you what you'll always find on a plasmid. You'll see selectable markers, antibiotic resistance cassettes, origins of replication, primer sites, which will be if you want to sequence the plasmid, you'll see inserted gene X, you'll see promoters for inserted gene X, you'll see terminators, you'll see all these things. Okay, now let's look at a basically, again, if you ever buy a plasmid, you get like a manual. It's literally, it's like a little car. You bought a little car, you get a manual with your car. You want to look at these things and you want to encode all this information. You want to be able to understand these things. So I actually assigned this as a reading assignment. I cut out the stuff you don't need to know, but I put in stuff specifically that is worth looking at. So you should look through this manual, which is a manual for a plasmid, okay? And in the plasmid, you'll get a map. So this tells you exactly uh, the map of the plasmid. So here you have the PBAD operator, here you have the ARC regulator, the PBR322 origin, it's ampicillin resistance cassette. Here's a multi-cloning site. It gives you a HIS tag. Here's the start codon, ATG. Now we talked specifically about how the, the, let's go back to this. When you code gene Y, into a plasmid underneath the promoter, in bacteria, does the spacing matter? Yes, we talked about that. The spacing matters incredibly. It will not work if you don't match it exactly, okay? So in these plasmids, you'll usually find three different versions, A, B, and C. What's the difference between these A, B, and C versions? They're all exactly the same plasmid, except they have different frames of reading, okay? So here's PBAD A, so right here, A. Here's PBAD B, here's PBAD C. And you should, I would encourage you to look at these things. Look at what the information they're showing you here. So here's the uh, ERA operator region. Here is another ERA operating region. What is this? Introduce. That's your start codon, okay? So if you, if you clone something in here, here are your restriction sites. When you clone it out, you need to plan it out so that clo it clones in what's called in frame, okay? If you don't put it in frame, which means there's three base pairs here for a codon, a codon here, a codon here, and if you mess up that frame, will your protein translate properly? No, okay? So you need to encode it in frame and the different A, B, C versions are different, the three different frames, okay? Is that, that kind of makes sense that you recall that from biology, the frame? Okay. So you can see all that information in these maps. Let's see. Okay, so other considerations that you need to think about with plasmids. 10 minutes left. I should be able to finish. Okay, so there's plasmids that are big and small. Plasmids that are big are very hard to work with. Plasmids that are small are very easy to work with. So if you're gonna start from scratch building something, would you rather start with a plasma that's big or small? Small, right. So there's all kinds of small plasmids that you would wanna work with instead of starting off with something big. Sometimes you have to start with something big, 10,000 base pairs, okay? And things get big because of all the things you need. So let's talk about a plasmid for Drosophila as an example. Let's talk about P-U-A-S-P-A-T-T-B. This is a plasmid, and the purpose of this plasmid is to insert gene X into Drosophila chromosome. Okay, let's talk about all the things that are in here. Okay, there's a multi-cloning site. Okay, there's what's called an upstream activating sequence. There's actually 15 of them, okay? And this is a regulatory sequence for your gene X. Gene X, okay? There is a selective marker for the bacteria. So step one is to assemble the plasmid in bacteria. So there's an AMP cassette, but that's not all you need. You also need to select for the plasmid in Drosophila. So you need a selective marker in Drosophila. And in Drosophila, it's what's called the white 
eye gene, which actually makes eyes red. Counterintuitive. But it makes genes red. It makes their eyes red. So what you do is you insert this plasmid into white-eyed flies, and if their eyes turn red, then you know they have your transgene. Okay? You also have an origin, origin, which is for your bacteria, bacteria, and you have what's called a ATTB site, which allows for site-specific integration. So you can actually choose exactly where on the Drosophila chromosome you want to insert, and that information is included into the plasma. So all this information adds up. Each of these has base pairs, right? So if you encode all this information, things start to get big. So PUASP ATDB is like 10,000 base pairs without an insertion. As soon as you start inserting genes, you make it even bigger and bigger and bigger. It gets harder to work with. So you need to consider big versus small when you are building stuff. That's a, that's a consideration point. You don't need to know this, this plasmid right now. You don't need to know this. I just use it as an example to, to show you what the things that make plasmids big. Um, okay, let's think about it from perspective of bacteria. So let's say the, the PUASP, I have to grow that in bacteria to store it, right? It's not always, I'm not going to grow it in my fruit flies because my and assemble it in my fruit flies until the very, very end. So I, before, I'm, before I'm ready, I grow it in bacteria. Okay, so let me ask you, does the bacteria want to replicate the 10,000 base pair plasmid that it has no use for? No. No, it's, that's a huge energy cost to the bacteria, okay? So sometimes if you put a massive plasmid in bacteria, they simply like won't. They will not replicate it because they don't want it. They'll try to spit it out, okay? So you can get rearrangements. They'll, they'll try to recombine the bacteria, or they'll recombine the, back, the plasma to make it smaller. They'll try to get rid of it. They'll try to mutate it. They'll try to do all this stuff. And you need to try to coerce the bacteria to hold it. So sometimes what you do is you, you, can, do, you can choose what would be an inducible, inducible uh, origin, or you can grow it in cells that induce replication of plasmids. So when I said plasmid origin dictates copy number, yes, that's true, but we can also choose origins or strains of bacteria that can also have exert an influence on that. So we can grow this big plasmid in a bacteria that will only keep it at one copy until we give it chemical X. And then once we give it chemical X plus chemical X, it will induce expression or replication of that plasmid to a high copy number. And in this way, we can keep the bacteria happy. It can store the plasmid until right when we need it. Then we add chemical X and it will induce the origin to replicate the uh, expression or not expression, the replication. Does that make sense? Yes? No? I'll get there. I'm just saying we can we can control the copy number of plasmids. That is a controllable element. I can tell the bacteria make a lot of plasmids or don't make a lot of plasmids. But you need to know that that possibility you're capable of that because it, you can only do that with special strains. Does that make sense? So you might want to do that if you're trying to build a really big plasmid. Um, let's see, five minutes left. So those are what are, those are, what are called inducible origins. Um, how do you prepare plasmids? So you'll hear this word a lot, mini prep, mini prep. Mini prep is when you grow a bunch of bacteria and then you kill them, kill them, and then you isolate the plasmids. So when I told you in the first lecture, we use bacteria because they're like little farms. We want them to replicate our bacteria. Harvest time comes, we kill them, and we isolate the plasmids. We can do that in a protocol that you'll often see called as a mini prep. You're mini prepping plasmids. Okay, there's also midi prep. What's midi prep? If one is mini, what's midi? Large. Larger, middle. So if you want to, if you want to, so this is mini prep is you just want a little bit of plasmid. Like day to day basis, you're usually just doing mini prep. Sometimes you want a middle amount of plasmid, so you do a midi prep. What's maxi prep? 
maximum. So oftentimes you want to purify a whole bunch of plasmid. Say you want to micro inject a fly with a plasmid. You will do a maxi prep and then you will put subject that plasmid to ultra purification procedures um, to get it super pure. And to do purification, you need a lot of sample. So you'll do a maxi prep to get the maximum. Um, you can also, so in those mini, mini, mini maxis, those are usually kits. So you'll buy a box. You'll buy like a box from a company that's called Kaijin Mini Prep, and you'll use this kit. It'll give you a little protocol. You follow the protocol. But there's also organic extractions. So when you take organic chemistry, have you all taken organic chemistry? Has anybody taken organic chemistry? Taking it right now. Okay. So the reason they make you take organic chemistry is because in molecular biology, we use organic chemistry every day. Okay. And if we want to extract, what kind of uh, molecules are plasmids? Nucleic acids, okay? So there are organic reagents that we use every day on a day-to-day -day basis to extract nucleic acids. So like phenol chloroform. We use this to extract nucleic acids, okay? Or actually to purify nucleic acids. So what you'll do is in, you can do, I put, I put BAMP here, which is, you probably don't need to know this, but it's bacterial alkaline lysis mini prep. So if you go through those letters, bacteria, you're growing bacteria, alkaline lysis, you're lysing them by making the solution basis. So you kill the bacteria, mini prep, and you're mini prepping with an organic extraction. So usually what you'll do is you can precipitate, precipitate DNA, okay? And then you can purify that DNA. And in that DNA is going to be your plasmids. So I'm just letting you know that there are protocols. You don't, you don't always have to use the kit. And sometimes using the kit is a crutch. Okay. You want to understand the chemicals that are used to purify nucleic acids. You want to know that stuff. So don't just ever, you, there's a thousand kits you can buy now that do this, do this, do that. You want to make sure you actually understand the steps underneath so that if the kit fails, you know how to fix the problem. Okay. Um, what does it, okay, let's see here. We got three minutes. So often I'll talk about agarose gel. So oftentimes when we are looking at plasmids, we will run an agarose gel. And we talked about this before. Let me just show you kind of what you see. So when you run an agarose gel of a mini prepped plasmid, so let's say we did a mini prep, uh, we're going to run that plasmid on a gel. Let's say we do our markers. So we do our markers. This is 1,000, or this is 1,000 kb. Actually, it start at usually 500, 1,000, 1 1.5, and then it usually goes to 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7, 8, up to 10. So let's say we run our plasmid. This is what your pattern will, what, what do you think your pattern would look like? You isolate mini prep plasmid. Here's what your plasmid looks like. What would it look like on the gel? Let's say it's 3,000 base pairs. So in theory, you'd think it would, it would look like that, right? In theory, you would think it would look like that. But it doesn't look like that. Here's what it looks like. It looks like this. You'll see three bands. And we talked about this already before. What's the top band? The top band are concatenated rings. So as the plasmid replicated, they got interlocked. Does that make sense? So what's up here is concatenated rings, okay? This is your single plasmid. This is what? We talked about this. Super coiled, super coiled. So I show you this because if you ever run a plasmid gel and your plasmid looks good, you'll see three bands, okay? Now what's gonna happen? So this is minus restriction enzyme. What's gonna, what's it gonna look like plus restriction enzyme? More. What? More. So what's the restriction enzyme do? It cuts it. It's gonna cut it. So is it gonna break apart all these rings? Yes. 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 What's it gonna do to the super coil? So if the super coil is like a rubber band, it's gonna cut it. It's gonna release all that tension. So when you digest plasmid into the linear plasmid, the only thing you will see is this. Okay, so plus restriction enzyme, you'll have linearized plasmid, which will run precisely at the size. Okay, now let's say you inserted gene X with restriction sites A and B, 
and you add A plus B. What are you going to see? You're going to see the backbone, and you're going to see your insert. Let's say your insert is 3,000 base pairs. Does that make sense? And let's say, let's say your insert, sorry, insert is 1,000 base pairs, your backbone is 3,000. This is what would be called restriction enzyme digest verification. Okay, so you've just verified that you cloned that gene to the plasmid by digesting it with the original restriction enzymes. And you can see those pieces and they match up with the sizes you expect. Does that make sense? So that's common, uh, a common technique that you'll see in papers to verify things. Uh, let's see, okay, let's end there. Good work. So the multi-cloning site is where you insert the gene that you want to use, or? Correct. All right.